So I'm going to very quickly go through um, what I look at when a patient has symptoms of hypothyroidism and kind of put a priority on it and hopefully give you some ideas of maybe how you can address that. Okay, if you're going to diagnose hypothyroidism, let me talk a moment about screening tests. Get a lot of questions on TSH as a screening test. There's a couple better screening tests than that. Anybody know a better screening test for hypothyroidism? Basal body temperature and ankle reflex. But what's your very best screening test you have? Your patient's symptoms. A screening test just tells you to do further testing to find out where the problem is. We're going to show you how, how you can use standard tests and identify where problems are. But when you make a diagnosis, it's, it's based on the patient's symptoms. That's what we should be doing in medicine, right? You, you, a patient comes in, they have symptoms, you diagnose what the problem is, and then you run tests to confirm your diagnosis. Hot, uh, thyroid tests should not be used to, to, to diagnose the patient. You diagnose based on the symptoms. And then you use the test to confirm that. And the test, I'm going to show you how the test can do more than confirm that they're hypothyroid. They'll actually tell you how to fix the problem if you know how to use them. All right. Now, the first thing I would test, if I only had one test I could run on any patient that came in and was hyper or hypothyroid by symptoms, and I only had one test, that's it, it's going to be TPO, thyroid peroxidase antibodies. The number one cause in the literature of all thyroid problems is autoimmune reaction. TPO will catch an autoimmune reaction 90-some percent of the time. You can also do thyroglobin antibody antigen. That'll catch it 70-some percent of the time. If you really, from the symptoms, suspect strongly that there's an autoimmune issue, do them both. It's rare, but once in a while you'll catch it with the one test and not the other. But I always run a TPO on every patient every time, even on follow-up. I've been fortunate enough to, in a couple patients to see a TPO within normal limits going up over a year and a half or two years and caught an autoimmune reaction going on very early hopefully before it did much damage to the thyroid and also mitochondria, okay? So I always screen for high, uh, antibodies, okay? Going backwards here, Jim. This is reverse of my little pointer thing, so I'm gonna have to get used to that. All right, in an autoimmune attack, you have to understand what you're having is destruction of the thyroid glands. Like if a person is sensitive to gluten, and you fire up the gluten antigen, it's cross-sensitive with the TPO antigen. So you fire up the TPO antigen, which attacks thyroid peroxidase, which is in the thyroid gland, which destroys thyroid gland cells. Those cells store up to four months worth of T4. When you destroy those cells, you release a lot of T4. And then the body's got all this excess T4, and you're busy converting to T3. And it converts to T3, and you've got symptoms of hyperthyroidism. Until that level goes down, and then you can, that's followed by a mild hypothyroidism. Over time, with repeated episodes, repeated attacks, your hyper symptoms become less hyper, less significant, because you have less capability of producing and storing T4 as you destroy a gland, and your hypothyroid symptoms become more pronounced. Eventually, you become hypothyroid. If you catch this reaction early on, when a patient's having symptoms of hyperthyroidism, you diagnose them as graves. If you miss it, the symptoms may not be significant enough in this patient to catch his hyper, or when you test them, it doesn't come back hyper because the reaction's over. They're not under attack at that time. Then they're diagnosed down the road as Hashimoto's. It's the same disease state. It's an autoimmune reaction. Now, there is an issue out there about iodine. Some people have said that uh, iodine can be a major cofactor and stimulator for the enzyme TPO. Iodine does some strange things. Iodine is very necessary for production, metabolism of, of the thyroid hormone, for receptor function. Um, it's important to have iodine at a good level to get optimal thyroid function. But some people have claimed if you give iodine, you can increase the levels of TPO antibodies. And I've given you those references. I have some question about that. I think it may be a different, I, I have a little bit different interpretation of, of what they're looking at there. Um, if you have an, an, an antibody reaction going on, you don't know what's worsening that reaction. You can't do a study on giving iodine until you control the reaction. Discover what's causing the autoimmune reaction in the first place, like identify that it's gluten, get rid of the gluten. Now you can see if iodine affects TPO. So I think that's kind of controversial because I put it in there because you'll hear other speakers say don't give iodine to somebody with a high TPO, it'll make it worse. Um, I think you have to watch it on an individual basis. 
Okay. Now here's some of the things that I do if they come back with a high antigen. First thing I always do, if it's thyroid especially, get them off of gluten for 60 days. You can go and test food sensitivities if you want. You can, you can test specifically for that antigen. I just get everybody off of gluten for 60 days, 100% off. Very tough the first 72 hours because some people have a, uh, the, the gluten antigen reacts with morphine-like receptors, so you get endorphins released and they're kind of hooked on that food. So it can be tough getting off. But if they, if, if they can do it for 72 hours, usually it gets easier. And usually in a week's time, they'll start feeling increased energy, uh, more regular bowel movements, less headaches, um, less runny nose, coughing, just some of these symptoms being caused by that reaction. Uh, Selenium has been shown in high dose to help suppress TPO, up to 800 micrograms a day. Magnesium is very critical to thyroid function in general. And there have been some studies, and again, I, I, I'm not sure that the studies are out there really it's not correlated as well as some of the people assume, but magnesium may help to reduce TPO in some patients. But I'm, I've got everybody on magnesium anyway, if they're having thyroid issues or adrenal issues. Very important. When you have an autoimmune reaction, you've got gut issues. Whether it started with a toxicity, a heavy metal toxicity or something else, you, you've got an inflamed gut. That, in fact, in my mind, many times that's where it started. That's where you started getting a leaky gut and you start absorbed proteins that weren't completely digested or you overwhelm the system with all the gluten you're putting in there and you develop this autoimmune reaction. So if you're going to fix it, you, when you get them off gluten-free, you've got to fix the gut. You've got to do those nutritional things to fix the gut and restore the normal GI flora. Uh, restore TH1 and TH2 balance. And we don't have time to go into that. The next two kind of contradict themselves. Avoid iodine supplementation with high PO. As per the previous side, if, slide, if you go along with that theory, uh, you don't give iodine as long as the TPO is high. I prefer to say if they've got an iodine deficiency, I'm going to replace the iodine, but I'm going to watch. I'm going to be careful about it. That, if that individual reacts and the TPO starts going up, then I'm going to wait till I can get the reaction under control and bring the TPO down. I haven't seen that clinically in that many patients yet, so my preference is to uh, address the iodine deficiency. Um, get rid of the things that have been known to precipitate attacks. 